Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 4, 2022, are Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. The psalm is Psalm 72, 1 through 7, and then 18 to 19. Romans chapter 15, 4 through 13, and Matthew 3, 1 through 12. Our usual second Sunday of introducing us once again, second Sunday of Advent to John the Baptist. Out in the wilderness, proclaiming a not so popular sermon. Oh, what are this popular? <laughs> well, yeah, because well, yeah. people are popular. But it, at the end of the day, though, come chapter 14, it's not going to be so popular with certain people. Right. right. There's that. There is that. Yeah. yeah. So there's great expectation here. Um, and you've just described that great expectation of um, what sounds like a wonderful, uh, oh, look at this. Let's go see what's happening out here with this crazy guy out in the wilderness is going to come to some truth telling that is going to be, uh, maybe maybe we don't want to follow him. We don't want to hear what he's got to say. But it's really happening right here where uh, John is calling out and, uh, and you know, saying, how are you hearing this word? Um, and in some ways, again, from hindsight, we know that the gospel is going to be spread among the folks that we least expect to receive it. Um, but it, it's happening right here at the very beginning of, uh, of John's ministry, where the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming and saying, I need to do something different with my life. And if the leaders of the religion, if the religious liter, I speak for a living. Sometimes I speak in tongues. That's right. We had a Pentecostal moment there for our. Ooh, the spirit come down. Ooh, the spirits come down. Uh, uh, at, at this particular moment, the religious leaders and the power brokers in their community are recognizing their need to change their patterns. Wow. Talk about a spirit-filled moment. That would be uh, the answer to a great Advent expectation, mm -hmm. that those who have been um, in power and using that power in non-productive ways would turn to offer the peace of Christ. And it, should, it would be as shocking for us as it was uh, for, uh, for uh, John, but maybe our response might be a little bit more receptive. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, go ahead, Matt. You can. I was going to go a slightly different direction. So, if you were going to follow that thread, go ahead. I have several different directions, but I'll just follow oh. that thread. I'll <laughs> follow that thread just a little bit farther. At the same time, when you know he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then their claim of "We have Abraham as our ancestor." is a really, if you're going to go down that direction, is a really interesting uh, response uh, in that, or well, Jesus says it, or John says it of them, but that, again, it reminds us of, of this theme of a call to integrity, that that the you might have a Abraham as your ancestor, but then what does that mean for your daily life? What does that mean for how you walk? And and how you talk, and so uh, and so, it's it's again coming back to those themes of of simul the simultaneity of judgment and salvation that we get in Matthew that uh, that John is calling everybody to to recognize. That's just a little thread. Go ahead, Matt, and I'll come yeah. back to. Well, it gets to that whole question of salvation. That mm -hmm. I think you're, what I was going to say, what I am going to say, gets to the question of salvation and how that works itself out. I think I'm drawn to this text this year in terms of how it sets us up to read Matthew as a whole. Mm -hmm. How this, t this is John's introduction of who Jesus is and what he's going to do, especially in verses 11 through 12. And it's easy to read that. It's easy to read the whole passage to say, oh, this is about confessing sins. That's what this, that's what John's ministry is about. That's what this is about. And it is about confessing sins. 
But the question is toward what end or why? Is it to make people feel bad? Is it to like make the world a better place? It looks like there's a morality test getting set up in some ways, especially with the language of bearing fruit. And, and Jesus cares deeply about bearing the right kind of fruit in this gospel. But I'm not sure that's the gospel, by the time we get to the end of the gospel, that it's all about morality, that there's way, there are ways in which Jesus will surprise that and upend that. So I think the passage is more about a division that's coming in society, right? It's about John sees Jesus as on a mission to repair a broken society, to repair a broken world, to repair broken lives in the midst of that world. And confession is less about admitting culpability, although for a lot of us it is that, but it's also about admitting need. It's also about admitting that brokenness and, of course, our role in it. But then that salvation is going to show itself. What's going to be so amazing is it's going to show itself in people like the meek and the peacemakers and the poor in spirit and others and and people of little faith who he never lets go of. Um, you see what I mean? That that, mm -hmm. that it's it's easy to read this as you know John's this crazy guy in the woods or not the woods but in the wilderness and he appears to have been exactly that. But he's. He's not, his target is not bad people as much as it's a bad state of affairs. I guess that, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah. Um, now, of course, those are related in some ways and right. with more people, some with, with some people more than with others. So yeah, before we get too interested in who's the chaff and who's the wheat and all of this, these divisive binaries that really will keep coming back to us throughout Matthew that we recognize that it's it's this idea that before you can figure out how to fix it all, somebody's got to come in and sort it all out um, and yeah. fix the stuff that's really broken and preserve the stuff that really needs preserving. That was a really long way of saying maybe nothing, but. No, I, no. I, I would say, uh, and I would add to that as well, Matt, that that sense of confession not you know not necessarily confessing your sins but it's a it's a kind it kind of takes you back to last week of that kind of attentiveness of an awareness of 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 where that where that brokenness is or what kind of situation or that that also that need for God's intervention and so then the location of this text becomes i think really important which are, which you could easily overlook you're like wilderness oh yeah wilderness you know jesus gets tempted in the wilderness and and you know the israelites were in the wilderness but wait stop right there that and the fact and then the fact that uh that john quotes isaiah isaiah 40 second isaiah which is the which is words to the Israelites who are in captivity in Babylon, that uh, that this is a call to um, this is a call to the wilderness again, in a sense, uh, where it was a place that and Stan Saunders talks about this that this place of of uh, he calls them away from the holy city and the temple toward the wilderness, a place of danger and testing, but also the place where Israel was formed, where God's provision and care was demonstrated, and where the people grew ready for God's promises. And so, how is it that we might think of Advent like that? Is this is this new wilderness or this re wilderness place of of those kinds of of awarenesses and that uh that it's that it's this place of of rescue and and that the wilderness yeah it wasn't you know it wasn't a fun time <laughs> but it was it was the place of rescue for israel and so that salvation becomes this liberating uh this this liberation from captivity of the of of some of the things that Matthew will talk about, uh, the the captivity of, of um, as Stan Saunders says again, before G John's ministry in the wilderness thus calls the people to remember who they were before their kings started building cities and temples, even before they had kings at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that whole background here is so rich for some of the themes that you're naming, Matt. I think that could really be... Um, really important for developing that thread. 
I, I agree and love it and uh, particularly love uh, the recognition uh, that the commentary and you've highlighted uh, makes about the place um, and the formative reality of the place, um, both in exile and in, uh, uh, you know, post uh, Egyptian enslavery, um, the wilderness wandering is a place where the faithfulness of the people is is truly made real. Um, and the difficulty of that faithfulness is made real. Um, a different train that I would offer that will show up um, repeatedly throughout uh, Matthew's gospel, we often read Matthew and talk about Jesus as the Moses-like teacher on the mountain. But another piece that's happening in, in Matthew's presentation, uh, we catch in uh, the second half of verse nine, um, where, uh, well, it's verse nine, which is the recognition um, that these are the descendants of Abraham. And what does it mean to, uh, 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 Matt, you kind of mentioned this, what does this, this mean to say, this is who we are? Um, but an assigned label, even with all of its expectations, does not define who you actually are. And there's a, um, one, there's a, the binary that you tell us to watch out for. Um, uh, throughout Matthew's gospel, there's going to be this recognition that, you know, I'm going to claim that I'm a, a child of Abraham, but there is no none of the promise of Abraham being experienced in the communities around me, um, which is why these religious leaders um, coming to saying, oh, my practices need uh, a change. Um, I'm using change as what repent means, not simply confession, but living a different way. Uh, changing uh, the direction of one's actions and therefore changing the consequences of those actions. Yeah. Um, but the other thing to see in this being a child of Abraham that's specifically named here by John is uh, a hint that the children of Abraham are going to be all the world. God is able from these stones um, the, the descendants of Abraham, the ones who will receive the promise from God, is going to expand once you begin to recognize that God is loving all of the world in, in every move that God is making. And uh, so I, we're going to see Abraham come up. Um, we're going to see this um, promise lineage and the promise uh, for the descendants and how that promise is made into all the world. And that would be another something to look for and maybe to thread through in your preaching over this season. Was that a uh, segue to Isaiah? It was. <laughs> I just, uh, I thought I'd spoken too much to be the one that starts it. <laughs> ah. Well, we just made a great transition then. Mm -hmm. We did transition. <laughs> I need this passage. I had a bad dream last night about a snake, so I'm really happy to see this. Oh, no. Yeah, a snake was like going after one of my kid's dogs. It was just, yeah, oh, terrible dream. So Very much terrible. My response was, let's just kill the snake. But with this <laughs> passage, apparently there's another way forward. So <laughs> this great image, right? Again, not just of society transformed, but the whole natural world transformed, you know, all of the things that we assume are written in some kind of immutable law of, of how to survive this really dangerous world mm -hmm. gets reimagined in, in some way, shape or form, even in the animal kingdom in the natural world, so to speak. So, which is beautiful, but also again, this idea of a God who is concerned about the poor and the meek and and the righteous, which again, language we'll see in the in the Beatitudes. Um, and such a rich text trying to figure out, well, Corey Driver talks about this a lot in a lot of his commentaries on Isaiah. Like, how are you gonna pick <laughs> just one thing or just one context? Because it, the, the language lends itself to historical contexts, so, kind of forward looking context toward Jesus lends itself to context in our own world and our own struggles today. 
It's great. Yeah. Just read it. Yeah. The promise, the, the, the descendants of the least expected. So the stump of Jesse, um, David was not supposed to be the selected one. Um, the shoot that comes from the stump of J David, the branch that grows out of this root. So there, there's your descendants. There's your promised one. And as you said, Matt, Matthew, Matt, is that what Matthew points out is a continuation of what Isaiah has made real. And that is God is concerned with redeeming all of creation and humanity. And it's, and we sometimes think of it as individual humans. And Isaiah is pointing out that the restoration that is coming is going to be cosmic. It, it's going to be huge. Um, and so this image is, in fact, rich um, and awe-inspiring. Yeah, and I think the that point, as both of you said, is, an, is very important. And maybe as strange as it might sound, uh, that discernment process is the question could be, where do you see the cow and the bear grazing together? <laughs> where do you see the, uh, these, these, you know, the wolf shall live with the lamb? Uh, where are those glimpses of God's, you know, redemption and liberation of, of entire and uh, salvation for the entire created order? Uh, could be really hard to see, but maybe it becomes another another activity of discernment or attentiveness for Advent. I must be in a really interesting space because my first thought when you said that, Caroline, was um, in a zoo. <laughs> and then my immediate thought after that was how poorly some of the maintenance of the zoos are, you know, just how are the, how are the animals actually cared for in some of these places where we've taken them into artificial uh, settings. Um, and, and so I'm like, okay, what's going on in your mind that you would take a wonderful place like the zoo and then recognize the worst of it? Um, but I think that that's the glimpse is that our efforts um, to establish the reign of God um, is only a foretaste or a glimpse. And if I make this a transition to the psalm, um, it becomes that it is God's righteousness and God's justice that is going to bring that cosmic um, a completion of creation's redemption. And maybe... This very literal, uh, give the king your justice, O God, which is a prayer for the king, uh, and the commentary exposes, um, might be what we ought to consider doing as well. Praying for the zookeepers. Okay, that came out a little harsher than I thought because my mind was thinking praying for the governmental leaders and zookeeper sounds kind of right for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to, to, to keep that thread alive in terms of our task to call on God for God's wisdom and God's um, grace and patience and justice and righteousness to flow from the earthly leaders who have power in influence to enable or inhibit our capacity to be a glimpse of God's good on earth right now. Good. Romans? Romans? Yeah, this is a really unfortunate choice of <laughs> why they left the first three verses of the chapter out is beyond me, but you could add those or you could just cut off verses four through six and start with verse seven as well, which is in some ways, I think the... Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, it's the coda of the of the letter's final part. This is after after several chapters of addressing how we are supposed to live. I think that this is 
in a letter that's written to a, a collection of house churches comprised of Jews and Gentiles, that this is in some ways pulling it all together, this line, welcome one another. Mm -hmm. And Jenny Peets talks about how welcome is maybe too tame of a word in, in English to describe what's going on here. But this is what Christ does in Paul's view as Paul bring or Christ brings together people who were estranged, people who have all sorts of legitimate reasons not to like each other, not to spend time with each other, not to let their kids talk to their kids. I mean, all the types of things. And Paul sees what Christ accomplishing is this radical new unity in his own body. And so Isaiah, um, Isaiah 11 doesn't make sense without that. Or I should say this, that's not the right way to put that. What Paul's saying here is what gives Isaiah its particular Christian sense yeah. in our churches and our congregations. Mm -hmm. This idea of a transformed world isn't complete, but begins in human reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So you want to see where lions and lambs are hanging out together, where wolf and sheep are. It's in communities where people have truly embraced and lived out this new mutual welcome that Christ makes possible. Every nation, every tongue, every tribe.